So welcome everybody. Um, basically, I have about 15 or 20 minutes to give you an overview of the, the last 40 years of my studies. No pressure. <laughs> uh, currently, and for the last 15 years, I've been, my philosophical view has been defined more as what I call Shiva Shakti Tantra. It is essential and very broad view, non-dual Tantra, Shaivite Shakti Tantra. And when we think about uh, yoga philosophy, many times students from around the world are really not clear that yoga philosophy has actually many different branches and many different viewpoints. In the United States and in North America and the West for the last hundred years or so, the yoga philosophy that most of us have been exposed to uh, would be considered more classical yoga or even Vedantic or Advaita Vedantic, which means non-dual uh, view. And Tantra is relatively new. For most of the Tantric uh, teachings that we find in English really only surfaced in the 20th century. And this was of a philosophy that fundamentally had its peak in India and in the north in Kashmir between the 8th and the 12th century. Uh, when, the, when the Muslim invasion of North India occurred in the 11th and 12th century, much of these teachings went underground and they were, they've been underground since and really only started to become revealed in the 20th century. So this type of philosophy for yoga is relatively new. And what I've done as a student and as a practitioner of Tantra over the years is take a very full survey of the different types of Tantric schools from what are considered very right-handed or very orthodox or even um, patriarchal. Even to the extreme, there are Tantras that are actually dualistic to the very left-handed, very radical, non-dual views that are very, very goddess-oriented. Uh, here in this room, you see, and many of the, the little yantras, these are called yantras, these are all tantric yantras from India. These are actually magical, mystical designs that are infused with the power of mantra. And they're literally, there's a whole geometric science behind the, their formation, their drawing. And if you look at this one up top here, this one is actually a Shiva Shakti uh, yantra. It is the upward pointing triangle is the power or the, the energy of pure consciousness and the downward pointing triangle that interlaces it is the power of that consciousness in the form of embodiment, the body, mind and emotions. Tantra itself, the word, it really just simply means a system, a a technology. It, in, and in my estimation, in my experience, it's a technology for delight. It's a technology for ecstasy. And the amazing thing, when I started to study Tantra on a more formal basis about 20 years ago, uh, I thought I was pretty knowledgeable in Indian philosophy. I'd been studying Indian philosophy formally since I was 13 years old. And when I got to Tantra, I was blown away because the first book I got was a scripture called the Spandakarikas, and it, is, it means the stanzas of the vibration of consciousness. And this is a thousand years old, and my background is in physics, so through all of my college, high school, and everything, all it, and even to today, all of my studies in quantum physics and astrophysics, here were manuscripts from Kashmir describing that consciousness is vibrating in every particle of everything on the planet, in our body, as our emotions, and our mind. And that this vibra vibratory embodiment is actually deeply orderly. And I was just stunned. And so when I looked further into it, it, it just opened this gateway that actually started to answer every main philosophical question I had. All the ones we all have, you know, it's like, you know, basically, why am I here? What is this all about? What is life about? Why would, if there, was, if there is a supreme being that is totally free, why would that being create a world of limitation where there is suffering and maliciousness and evil? 
that we hear about, if you wish, every day. How could this happen? And what, why are we here? And this tantric philosophy actually was, has been the most elegant philosophy to describe every question that I've ever wanted to know. And it's amazing too because some 30 years ago, I started to work therapeutically on people in Houston, Texas at a clinic. People would come in and I was the guy of what they call last resort. Um, somebody come in with the back pain or a shoulder problem and the other doctors in the clinic didn't know what to do. They sent them down the hall to me, not that I really knew more than they did uh, or really what to do, but I took the premise that life is deeply orderly and in the order of the body there has to be some sort of principles of energy flow and i use that and by certain even trial and error um, i started to see that there is a system a system of order and again i went back to the scriptures and i found that there were there are actually writings from great yogis over a thousand years ago that actually clearly described the energy body and how to work with it for the revelation of our true nature. The true nature is described by Tantra as a scintillating, vibrating, unbounded field of consciousness, awareness, that literally reverberates with the power of unbounded creativity, completely free, completely full in its vastness. It is the actual vibration of auspiciousness itself. It is absolutely good and sacred and divine. It rocks with the delight that has no bounds. It literally is this shining joy it's called Ananda in Sanskrit, which is very difficult to translate, but basically the most ecstatic moment you've ever experienced, you just amplify that beyond. And that is at the very nature of every particle of our being, every cell of our body. The deal is, of course, is most of us don't see that, and we're in this cloaked day to day, and for 30, over 30 years of teaching yoga, almost every student that's come into my class has always just said, you know, I'm here for my back, or I'm here for, I have stress in my life, or uh, I have emotional distress in my relationship, my job, and whatever, and I'm just coming for freedom. I want to be free from this pain and this suffering. And some others just say, you know what, I feel good. It's not, nothing's really uh, terrible happening in my life. I just want to be free to celebrate and free to be more artistic. And in every case, I said, perfect. You know, this is the perfect uh, path for you because there is actually a science to aligning with nature in ways that revelation can take place more effectively. This is the magic of Tantra. So you don't even have to, basically all you want have to do to, to start is have a longing for a little bit of freedom. And then you learn actually technical principles to actually become skillful in the aligning with this energy that moves in the form of our breath and the beating of our heart and the energy that infuses our mind with imagination and thoughts and the whole spectrum of emotions that we have. So when you use this technology and you line up just so, you get these openings. And it's just many times it's a flash. And many times it can be in the very first class you take. It can be in a moment where you're just hanging out with a loved one at a meal or you walk out and you just see the, the mist clearing from the treetops and the mountains. Some moment allows you to access a deep place within yourself. It's just a gateway opens up. And we've all experienced that in a deep love with the closest friend, uh, a beloved, uh, again, moments with beauty. We've all had that, but many times they're fleeting and we taste it and then we long for it again more consistently and it, it, it eludes us seemingly. And it creates so much suffering and, and so many people are just, uh, just confounded on what is this all about? Why have I tasted a little bit of freedom and yet now I live with so much uh, discomfort and even suffering? Well, Tantra is an amazing philosophy because it, pres it presents a view that really can actually be affirmative to anybody's position and anybody's state 
Uh, it can be affirmative and positive for basically anything that occurs in your life. So it is, for me, it is this tr amazing alchemical process that no matter where I am, and no matter the time under the circumstances, even the most challenging and really many times super painful experiences, there is skillful ways to navigate even that moment to align with energy for a revelation to take place more and more. So these moments of revelation start to become more established inside. And you start to walk around and you start to see and truly experience the universal and everything you're touching, tasting, hearing, seeing, and feeling every, every part of the day. So it becomes, everything becomes a gateway to that part of your heart. And it is just so, it's incredible. And it's not that you don't have tears and it's not that you don't have troubles but these become much more in a context that you never lose a perspective that the sun is always shining and that there is a spirit of life that is essentially good. We absolutely have suffering and troubles, but that's not the ground of being. That's not the ground of our heart. And this is something that you, each of us, gets to experience directly. It's not, you could read the books, which I've done, and it's helpful, it's a good map, but ultimately, you can take anybody that doesn't read and they get a deeper experience of self-love and self-respect and self-honor. And this is the highest for me. So if you come in with, you come to me with a sacroiliac subluxation or a rotator cuff injury or you have an immune system dysfunction or whatever, I use technologies that are actually very ancient. And they're, in so many ways, they're very, very sophisticated, but they're also incredibly elegant. For me, this is a philosophy really for the 21st century. You know, when, you look, when I look back and I travel the world, and for 21 years I've been doing world tours, and the world now is closer than ever before. And it's beautiful for me because I see so many different world cultures merging, you know? And we really are just working and sharing together so uh, much more closely in every regard. And here's one view that can cross and interweave philosophies, religions, variety of cultural aspects that can literally support. And so instead of trying to shift them out of their religious or cultural view. It gives something, it's a very positive perspective that allows them to actually be bolstered and enhanced in whatever view. So Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, whatever, wherever you are on the planet, whatever language, there can be an alignment that life is good, that there is a goodness at the very essence of each of our hearts, that this life is actually one where we can be artists. That is, it's a never-ending art project where you just get more and more skillful at living. That everything that um, you get to experience and be exposed to, and really the most mundane and ordinary things, your basic family life that many people say, oh my gosh, it, you know, it is somewhat just drudgery again, here I go. I, I have to do all the laundry and the cooking or whatever, and I'd rather be just uh, doing deep meditative philosophy or deep, uh, these deep mystical, magical things of yoga, but I'm here just doing laundry. And the thing is, is that Tantra can show you how laundry can take you to a place of wild freedom. <laughs> that is what's so cool. So it's not like, you know, you basically get to actually embrace family life in a way you haven't before. You don't have to go anywhere to go to a special place. You can find it magically everywhere. Any circumstance, you can take a profaned place and shift it to a sacred space. You can, you can take something that's ugly and you can start to manifest and reform it, transform it into something that is so inspiring when you see it that you remember that there is the Supreme. So this is Tantra. This is, this is and what, what I've been trying to do for the last few years is take essential principles of the wide spectrum of Tantra that, again, was delineated for hundreds of years in Kashmir and India, and literally pull out the principles 
that are universal for all people. You know, we're not, we're not going to be able to go to back to Kashmir 10th century and act that way or be that. That's not who we are. We're 21st century here. We're Western culture. Uh, we have very specific and unique challenges right now, a, a really unprecedented ever, ever in the planet's history. So for me, this has got to be the most exciting incarnation my soul's had on this planet, I think, ever. So I'm super fired up to be here. And I love to be able to share these, uh, these principles of Shiva Shakti Tantra with all of you. So what I've done is look at right and left-handed Tantra in the spectrum and then condense the set of principles, showing metaphysically, giving the metaphysics, basically, what is this world? Who are we? How is it structured? How did it come into being? What is, the, what is the sequential process and the unfoldment of spirit into embodiment? For there is a deep order to it. And that's what blows me away and excites me every single day. Because every day I get to meet somebody that is uniquely different. There's, you know, even the twins that I um, have in class uh, today, you know, they're very different. And yet, at the same time, there's a deep universal order within every one. So even though at first it just seems confounding, every single body I see it has different alignment. But if you really look in a bigger view, there is an optimal blueprint for everybody, for all of us. There is a way that the body is deeply ordered. Today, you know, in kind of even more new agey, if you will, or I don't know, sort of neo uh, yogic circles, we, we, you hear about chakras and kundalini and all of this. All of that is derived directly from the tantric tradition. So it is a clear study and a clear practice that there is energy that flows in the body and the mind in a very deeply beautiful way. And if you know where it is and how it moves, you can cooperate with it you can serve it in ways that you can have an ever-expanding, beautiful life. So it's super positive philosophy, and I'm just thrilled to be able to share it with you. So that's just a very simple overview of Shiva Shakti Tantra and what I do. And now for the next few minutes, I can open up the floor for questions and get a little bit more specific. So um, Mickey in the back first. Is Tantra like a uh, sort of like a natural progression of the thought line, or is it a competing philosophy? Yeah, good question. So Mickey, um, Mickey's question is, is Tantra in the philosophy of India a, something that has been uh, maybe progressive, or is it something that is maybe competing in the other, or maybe even um, mutually exclusive to some of the other philosophies? A beautiful thing about Indian philosophy, and if you ever read about Indian history, is it, it moves like a river, and literally it takes what has gone before and brings it into itself, and then it actually moves into the future in new, innovative, and, up, and uplifting ways. So it isn't so static or rigid in time. What's amazing, when you study Tantra, and again, the period of time is fairly recent, you know, uh, eighth to 12th century is the culmination of this thought and practice until it got more into the more the shadowy it got hidden a lot and you still see it uh, move through India but it get it gets hidden from the 12th century uh, till like the 19th 20th century that they bring in that even Vedic philosophy that had gone on for 5,000 years so when you hear you know you often hear yoga is 5,000 years old and the reason we even use that date is up in Pakistan, in the Indus Valley, some archaeologists found some little terracotta, little figurines that are yogic looking. And they said, ah, this, they must have been practicing yoga back, you know, uh, at this date, 3,500 years before the Common Era. Um, and, and yet, it is really, this has just been a cultural visual view that spirit is part of this world. And then it progresses through India, through the centuries, and then it takes on different paradigms. There's even a, a classical yoga paradigm is actually dualistic. So you have, you literally have matter on one side and spirit on the other. You have your body, your mind, your emotions as a container for spirit. 
And the way that you get free of your problems, your suffering, is actually to create what's called kaivalya, which means that you want to isolate your spirit from this material casing. So we call it yoga, but in fact, it's actually separation. That's classical yoga. That's what's the scripture of Patanjali in 195 aphorisms. And then you have, you have Advaita Vedanta, which then moves later in time into um, this more common era. And in the common era, there's a thought that this world is really just maya, that this is just, it's just the workings of a spirit in a way that is creating an illusion, that this isn't ultimate reality. And so any sort of clinging onto your body and your mind or things that are phenomenal and temporary, it's just going to lead to suffering. So that was one view too. And that was actually very popular when in 1893, when Swami Vivekananda came to the United States and he was one of the first yogis from India that presented to a Western audience at the uh, Parliament of World Religions in Chicago in that time, it was actually September 11th, he, he uh, took on more of a Vedantic point of view. And so through the early 20th century in the West, we have more, we've taken on more of that, that Vedantic point of view. And yet, Tantra now is starting to become more uh, integrated into society. Baba Muktananda in 1970 was one f yogi that came to the United States uh, at that time. It was just some years after we repealed an immigration law here in the United States that blocked uh, Indians and many Asians from immigrating and coming to the States from about 1924 to about 1965. It's one reason that only since like that period, the, the mid-60s, do we have this upsurge in yoga interest and in this type of philosophy. So basically, as educated as we might be, tantric philosophy is actually pretty new on the horizon. Uh, another reason really quickly is that a lot of these scriptures are in libraries on little palm leaves and they haven't been translated into English and no one even knows, even knows about them. So we're just getting some of these teachings out in English. But Tantra literally pulls and brings in everything of the past and utilizes whatever it finds to be life enhancing. So one way to look at Tantra is that you, you make new clothing out of old pieces of fabric. You literally weave together. The word tan means to stretch and tra means in the suffix in this way, a device. It could be, it could be like a, a warp and woof of a weaving machine the Tantra is taking the old things, the old ideas of the past, and weaving them into a new and present paradigm. It's perfect for us. It doesn't throw, it honors the past, but it's innovative for the future. It's a good question, Mickey. What else? There are people with emotional imbalances um, and expressive. And I think it would be more difficult to show them the beauty of life. So what is your... Yeah, that's great. You on that. Mm -hmm. That's great. <clears throat> so, in general, it's absolutely true that we can not only have by sociological effect, but even chemical effect on our brain, where you look out and you don't see beauty. I was just with a, a young man the other day who has chemical imbalance, and we looked and we were standing on literally a, this gorgeous mountaintop, and I said, what do you see out there? And he just, he could not, he just couldn't feel it. But what, what was so cool is that when he and I, when I really connected with him, was it has not always been that way for him. There is, there was a few times in the past when he connected, and we, and I really was able to find a time that he connected to this particular girl and a particular time when as soon as he was even recalling it you could see a little bit of extra light so even though he couldn't see it right then it was something that at least he could hold on to instead of saying look it's all black it's over and this happens to so many around the world suicide happens every day in the world and there are some areas of the world where it happens more and more um, and when you have that kind of imbalance, or for whatever reason, you've been really so wounded, and you look out, haven't we all been in a place of sadness? 
And this is to the point where it becomes so dark that you just even become self-loathing to the point when you just think it's all over. But if you can have somebody actually tell you the truth and the process of what we did with, I did with this fella is we sat down on the grass and I started giving him breathing exercises. I gave him breathing exercises to literally help to balance his breath. So when he was breathing and I listened, it would go like, He had, his exhale was dominating his inhale. He was depressed. How you doing? <sighs> Not that good. <sighs> so I said, all right, let's do this. Breathe a little stronger. And I had him breathe so that his inhale became as strong as his exhale. And we, we, I actually gave him also mantra. I gave him a vibration that he actually, like a homeopathic, would take, and it was in a few minutes, he started to honestly shift a little bit. And I'm not saying this always works. In this case, it was amazing. Uh, and we just talked, and I, it wasn't like, hey, you, this is the way you are. Right now, this is where you are. It's totally fine. It's totally, this is, you know, depression or whatever. This is the state of, human, you know, this is a human natural state. And just embracing himself like that, instead of thinking he was, something was wrong with him, there are all, all little bits of little self-respect and self-love started to come up again. And then just doing these little exercises and a couple other things, he started to have a little bit more light. And then we did Hatha Yoga. We did, and I did certain postures with the breath and a little bit more backbending things that got him more energized. And you can literally see the prana scintillating in his eyes. His eyes were brighter at the end of the session. His mother, I got him back to the house and his mother said, oh my God, Look at him, he looks so good. And she, she started to cry because he, he had an energetic shift. And it didn't mean that, again, he's suddenly better, but he started to think, you know what? I, 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 have, um, I have the will and the courage to keep going. The next day he started jogging, and I checked with him over the last week or two, and he's been exercising. So the thing is, is that you, we put ourselves in a position where a little revelation can happen. And we're all, as a community, helping each other, support each other, because we just have to be patient with each other. Some people are going to be down for a while. And you just have to say, you're just not allowed to quit. I mean, that's basically it. It's like you can't give up. Even though it's going to be black and dark, that's where you're going to be. And amazing experiences coming out of that many times, it's really a hero's journey. You get somebody who's gone through that and comes back out the other side, man, they will never forget. And they're bright and powerful. So it's, it can be a really, it's, you never want anybody to ever go through that. That's very horrific. At the same time, it could change this man's life, this young man's life, in a positive way. So thank you for that. One more question. Yes, in the back. Actually, this is connected because as you were speaking about that, I, the first question I had was the connection of the flows that you're talking about energetically to things like Jinshin Jitsu, acupuncture, yes. whether it's Japanese or Chinese, and then based on what you were just speaking mm -hmm. to, how do you feel about shifting that by doing energy work in addition, because yoga is energy work, but doing that type of energy work to, to help with that revelation? That's the key. You know, it's like, you have to have an energetic opening. Like when you, we all know, like if we, if you, you eat better, you do a little exercise. I mean, basically just, you know, have people walk around the block. People are saying, what kind of yoga should I do? It's like bend over. Like when was the last time you bent over, you know? And uh, so it's not like major, okay? And that gets energy moving. Now here's the thing is, what it does is you get energy moving where you start to be able to, it, you do get a little bit more clean on the mirror of your heart or your eyes, and you do start to see more connections, and you start to see the positive more. But still, it is very helpful that in addition to that kind of practice, you literally get to hear a positive message. Like if somebody reinforces it with you, and you, it helps you to direct your view to a positive view, and then you open up your energy, that's key. Because for instance, you can have a negative view and have a lot of energy moving. You can be very potent energetically and very charismatic and very negative, and that's very dangerous. And that's what it, it's, you know, I can give you a lot of historical record of leaders who have totally mis, 
appropriated the seat of their power. They're very potent people, like they have a lot of Shakti. And they have been, you know, there's, they've really um, had some unskillful actions that hurt people. So just because you have a lot of energy coming out of your eyes, doesn't mean that you're necessarily spiritually advanced in that way, nor have you, um, you know, that uh, you're going to have a revelation in that way. But if you have a positive view and you do these practices, when you do have an unfoldment, it's just right there before you. Everything that you were least wishing for and holding, it starts to come and then it's just reinforced. And then it, every day, it's not like after all these years, I mean, there's definitely, every, periodically I get into doubt and I, you get, I get into the whole variety of different emotions. But thank God these days, I've never really lost my way. You know, even when I've been so uh, literally grief stricken that I couldn't get out of bed or so angry uh, at something I thought that was uh, so wrong that, uh, you know, I, that my heart was uncontrollable and, uh, or just so scared that I trembled. And at the same time, I didn't lose my view that there is a goodness that rocks in everybody's heart. And even the person that I felt wronged me and my family, you know, that by that view, then I was able to have forgiveness. Um, and this is super positive. And then you live a life that it's just every day. It's like, what a good day and what a beautiful day to be with everybody. And everybody I get to meet is like totally delightful. And it's like every day is a total blessing for me. You know, it's all bonus for me now. So it's just like uh, it's a good day to die. It's perfect. And so uh, I'm just super happy to be here. I have my teacher, Bill Mahoney, in, in, in the room in front of me and his lady, Pamela, thank you so much for being here and um, all of you. So I'm really grateful that hopefully what you hear and just even the energy of the message is there's a positive Shakti. There's a good energy. You feel a little uplifted. You feel a little inspired that despite troubles and uh, some really nasty things going on in the world right now, really scary things, that we don't give up, that we work toward being more skillful and aligning with the divine. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk. My, my delight too. So blessings. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you all. Thank you.